said, my name is Molly Dunton and I'll be presenting the feasibility of biomass for regional energy independence in Northern California. Um, I'm proud to represent my amazing team today and I want to thank our managers Claire and Maya and, and Professor Hill for a great semester. Um, today I'll be talking about biomass energy as well as our client research and findings. Um, we heard a little bit about biofuels in the first presentation and I'll be speaking to one specific strategy for biomass deployment in California. Our client is the Pacific Forest Trust, a nonprofit forest conservation organization based in California. Their mission is to sustain America's forests for their public benefits. They work primarily with private landowners to manage and use forests sustainably. Before COVID-19, California wildfires were arguably one of the worst disasters we faced as a country. And while the pandemic is likely to continue dominating headlines throughout the summer, California is about to enter its wildfire season. Our research focuses on the ways we can mitigate fire risk by improving forest management. Centuries of fire suppression in California have led to a buildup of ladder fuel in the forest. This is dead or downed wood as well as new uh, vegetative growth. As you can see on the left side of this picture, untreated forests with more ladder fuels are less resilient to fires. This fuel is predominantly small diameter woody biomass with no monetary value and the only options for disposing of it are burning it or sending it to a landfill. There are a few other potential uses, but none are currently scalable. The state lacks adequate resources to clear this biomass. Utilizing it for subsidized small scale energy generation has been a part of California's forest management strategy for decades. Additionally, power lines in forested areas can quickly become fire hazards and are often shut down by utilities during strong winds as a way to prevent wildfires. This leaves thousands of residents without power for extended periods of time and frustration with utilities as fostering support for the idea of transitioning off the grid. We looked at a nine county region in Northern California that spans 30,000 square miles and is home to 600,000 residents. This is a heavily forested rural region that provides invaluable ecosystem services, such as drinking water for 25 million people. Much of the region is also located in fire hazard zones. We evaluated whether or not this region can use the surplus of biomass in local forests to minimize fire risk, generate energy, and transition off the grid. To answer this question, we relied on primary sources as well as publicly available data. We had the privilege of speaking with 15 experts from a wide range of sectors, and personally, this was my favorite part of the project. We spoke with conservationists, scientists, foresters, utilities, and government agencies. We then completed five case studies of biomass facilities within the region, three in-depth analyses, and the design of three different scenarios. The first step in our research was to figure out just how much woody biomass actually needs to be extracted from the region's forest to reduce fire risk and determine if the region could power itself with that biomass. There is no official estimate of how much ladder fuel exists in these forests, so we generated our own, approximately 95 million bone dry tons. I should note that our estimate only covered the woody debris or the dead down material and does not even include the new growth. Average annual electricity consumption in the region is 5 million megawatt hours, which equates to roughly 5 million bone dry tons of biomass burned in a power plant. Realistically, the region will never get all of its power from biomass, but this serves as a conservative benchmark for our estimates on supply. We concluded that there is more than enough woody biomass in the region's forest to meet its energy demand. The second step in our research was an environmental assessment of biomass energy and its capacity to deliver net benefits for forests, communities, and the climate. In 2018, California wildfires released almost as much carbon dioxide as the state electricity sector emits in a year. Removing ladder fuels from the forest is essential to reducing wildfires and subsequently reducing carbon emissions. Although biomass is a type of renewable energy, it will never be clean like solar or wind because we're talking about burning wood for power. We analyzed California's estimates for particulate matter and carbon dioxide pollution resulting from wildfires specifically within our region in 2018. We then compared this to the potential emissions from 5 million bone dry tons of biomass energy. Our figures for biomass cover its entire life cycle from the construction of facilities to the transportation of fuels to combustion. You can see in this table that wildfires are a much larger source of potential emissions in the region. We cannot predict the severity of future wildfires, nor are we asserting that biomass will completely eradicate them. 
What we do know is that biomass energy could incentivize forest thinning and reduce fire risk. Most of the experts interviewed agreed that doing something intentional with this wood is preferable to letting it be fuel for a wildfire. The next step was to determine if an expansion of biomass energy would be financially or logistically feasible. Initially, we explored fully separating the region from the grid, and we found that that would be really costly. A standalone biomass plant can provide electricity during power shutoffs, but to do this, you need to construct new power lines that circumvent the existing grid that would be shut off. Each mile of line costs upwards of $800,000. For comparison, the largest city in our region, Chico, California, has an annual capital expenditure budget of only $1.3 million. Additionally, biomass is one of the most expensive types of energy on the market. In California, it's more expensive than solar, wind, and natural gas. New facilities require high amounts of capital investment. Examples in our report range anywhere from 16 to $90 million per facility. Because of these high costs and its low returns, facilities depend on state subsidies to be viable. There are 11 active biomass facilities in the region, currently producing a total of 250 megawatts of power. Several regional timber companies use their own woody waste products to heat and power their sawmills, known as cogeneration. This is a really effective model but to expand the biomass industry, other types of facilities will be needed. One biomass plant in the region provides power to a city during power shutoffs, and this demonstrates how biomass can support regional energy independence. Existing biomass subsidies target electric utilities, and currently the state mandates a minimum level of biomass energy procurement from fire hazard zones. After determining that separating from the grid was cost prohibitive, our research shifted towards how the region can become more energy secure and minimize fire risk all while utilizing the current grid. One option is to place biomass facilities at substations within the region. Pacific Gas and Electric or PG&E is the primary electric utility in California and they were recently found to be liable for billions of dollars of wildfire damage. As part of their settlement, they are investing in microgrids to make the California energy system more resilient. We spoke to PG&E directly about the potential to integrate biomass power plants into these microgrids. A second option is community choice aggregation, a tool often used by communities to take control of their energy mix and integrate renewable energy. CCAs can work with utilities or local facilities to purchase biomass power. We faced some challenges in our research, but I'm happy to say that none of them proved to be real barriers. Uh, the main challenge that we faced was multiple research objectives. On one hand, we want to protect the forests, but on the other, we're analyzing a controversial energy source. We had to come to terms with the fact that biomass energy is never going to be an ideal climate or public health option, especially when compared to other renewable energy sources. Biomass is not the easy or obvious choice, but this actually made for a fascinating semester for us. The second challenge we faced was working with a diverse group of stakeholders from the community level all the way up to state government. This is a complicated issue with a lot of calculations around externalities and trade-offs. How those calculations are done depend entirely on who you are and what your priorities are. We were mindful of this and tried to be as objective as possible. Finally, there's a lack of data from the region on things like the available fuel stock in the forest. What we completed was a preliminary analysis based on the available data, but further research is definitely needed. So to conclude, our research led us to several key findings. Biomass energy can be an effective tool for forest management and we determined that there is sufficient biomass available to power the region. But is it environmentally preferable? If you compare biomass energy to wildfires, it wins. But if you compare it to low carbon solutions like wind and solar, it loses. Its economic viability is also questionable. The existing industry relies heavily on subsidies funded by utilities and ratepayers, but these subsidies need to be expanded for the industry to grow and it will be politically challenging to raise more public funding. We determined that it is not economically or logistically feasible for the region to separate entirely from the grid, but that there are options for biomass facilities looking to integrate with existing grid infrastructure. Biomass energy can certainly be a short-term strategy for forest management, but it will never be a long-term solution. Additionally, California is aiming for 100% clean energy by 2045, and seeing as biomass is not carbon neutral, facilities will need to be phased out by then. Some experts believe that with effective forest management, it's possible to get the forest to a stable state within 20 years and before this deadline. The urgency of wildfires demands swift action and biomass energy represents one potential solution. Thank you and I'll take any questions. Thank you. 
Do we have any questions from the group? <laughs> I see a lot of a lot of hands on applause. Okay, Zach has a question. All right, Zach, you should be unmuted. A topic that I was really interested in pursuing as well. So I'm glad that uh, that you all did a great job with it. Um, I've long accepted I've, I've that I've become a broken record. So I'm just going to ask the question. Um, to what extent do you all look into bioenergy with carbon capture and storage? Um, I, I, I think I heard from you all that you all looked into it a little bit. Um, I, if I had to hazard a guess, it's probably because it was economically unfeasible for the region. But if you could talk a little bit about that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks. I mean, definitely right off the bat, it is extremely expensive. Um, but I think that there's some other things I would like to mention as well. California has um, pretty stringent um, air permitting requirements and regulations already. Um, so, you know, there's sort of a balance between California is sort of a leader in that space. And, you know, again, there's always going to be particulate and pollution from these types of facilities to, to the degree that you can um, use modern technology and scrub some of that pollution away, the better. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of the sort of community scale facilities we were looking at, that kind of technology is just not carbon capture specifically is not feasible, but again, I, I would say that a lot of these facilities are using um, so, some more modern kind of smokestack scrubber technology. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, I, I think, do I see a question from Josh? Yep, Josh should be unmuted. Uh, hey, Molly, nice job. Congratulations to you and your team. I was just curious, could you elaborate a little more on how you estimated the volume of dry material that was available? Uh, was that based off of maps or USGS work? Um, yeah, so there's actually a forest service uh, methodology for sort of estimating this. Um, it's not a perfect science um, because even with the best models, we can't necessarily factor in things like rugged terrain and access to the material. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a very highly variable um, pool of data. It really kind of depends on who you ask and what assumptions, you know, people were using in their reports. Um, but we did rely on a forest service methodology to at least estimate the amount of sort of dead down wood. Um, and again, that wood could be at different stages of decomposition. Um, so not all of it might even be good for biomass energy. Um, but we wanted to kind of get a sense of, you know, how much of this stuff is there at least to start. Um, and I would also stress again that it doesn't include the, the new sort of green vegetative growth in the understory, which can also be an important ladder fuel. Okay, we have time for one more question if there is one. Yeah, Alyssa was curious what findings you may have come across that take existing ecology into account with the strategy. Absolutely, um, I'm glad someone asked about this. Um, our research and our report in this presentation, you know, really focused on sort of the, the emissions comparison and, you know, really trying to, to figure out if this would produce net emission benefits, net emissions reductions. Um, but we did come across a lot of other sort of environmental ecological trade-offs. Um, so an example of a positive thing that's not emissions related, um, thinning out the forest can actually improve water capture and can actually help the health of the local watershed. Um, unfortunately, there is some concern among scientists that you could over thin the forests and that manual thinning, so using machinery, might actually reduce the biodiversity of the forests. So these are just two examples to show you that this is really, biomass is kind of a can of worms and there are trade-offs around every corner. 